So here's the plan, and, and this can happen really fast. I have two objectives. One is to give you a sense of the agricultural sequence prior, prior to Mr. Rabasa's arrival, 1874. Did I get that right? Good. Um, and to give you a sense of what was going on before. And then also I wanted you to see the immigration quotas. Um, and to understand how the United States government looked at immigrants from Croatia and from Yugoslavia at that point, Austria, Yugoslavia, w w whatever, and they're going to straighten that all out for you. Thank God, because um, I'm not sure I can do it. Um, so let's, let's start with, with Watsonville. Watsonville is really easy. Um, first of all, it was laid out illegally by a man by the name of John Watson who um, did not have title to the land, but in 1850 it didn't matter. Um, so they laid out the town, and the town, and here's the way it works. I don't know what they've told you in school. This is the Pajaro River, believe it or not. Right, right here, there's the coast. Watsonville was laid out as a river crossing. That's the reason it's here. It's about getting across the river. Every town in Santa Cruz County on the coast is a river crossing. And some of them difficult. Aptos, very difficult. Uh, a lot of canyons. Uh, Soquel, pretty easy. So they're back in off the coast because the land is swampy. You don't say swamp anymore. Uh, wetlandy. Um, you know, the sloughs and swamps have changed into wetlands, and I don't know when that happened. But you've got, you've got um, the river, and then the town, because it was laid out. Well, there goes one. Doesn't matter. I don't need it. I'll go like, right like this. All right, pretty simple so far. That's Main Street. Um, it should be black, but it's blue here. You can, you're, you're adults, you can do this. Um, and then the crossing was here, um, and then the town laid out fairly regularly, like that. There, that's the history of Watsonville. Pretty, pretty cool, huh? Um, with the main branch, and then as the town grew, they went off on either side. Uh, laying out streets. Now, the, the big turn in the story, which I'll get to in a second, um, a little bit more detail. Um, let me go back to that outline, if I can find it. Okay. Mexican Spanish era. Mexican Spanish, the missions, Mexican era, pastoral, cattle. This was rangeland. Beef and beans, that was it. Um, very little intensive agriculture, in fact, none to speak of. In 1850, there were a few immigrant farmers, not many, some of them Irish. They came in, and because of supplying agricultural products to the mines, to the gold mines, somebody locked onto the idea of potatoes. There was a potato rush. See, in agriculture, and I'm telling you this, um, it's boom and bust, and it's, it's chasing the next year. So if somebody makes a lot of money here, then everybody the next year will be doing what they were doing the year before. So the trick is, it's kind of like the pyramid game, you want to get in early. Um, and then um, what will happen is because you're growing more and more and more, what happens to the price? Goes down. Okay, so in the potato rush, 1850-51, there were guys who made a fortune. And so all the other guys that are still running cattle, you know, they all sit up straight and look around and go, wow. So they plant potatoes, and it takes actually two years. And then the price of potatoes goes just in the dumper. Now this, this experience, um, how should I say, vaccinated local farmers. They they knew they became very reluctant to chase anything. So when the next crop comes, which is basically cereal grains, wheat, barley, oats, um, they're going to lock onto that, and then you can't pry their fingers off of those things because they, they got burned in, when the price of potatoes went down. The price of potatoes went down so much that, how low did it go, Sandy? Well, let me show you. That these, the lower lots on Main Street um, were filled in with potatoes. Um, 
in other words, Watsonville's built on rotten potatoes, just as a, a sort of a sense of how this works. But you see, that's, that's a memory. That's a memory. Oh, no, you don't want to do that. We want to grow wheat. wheat. Wheat's dependable. Wheat's shippable. We can do wheat. Um, so that when other people start coming in and saying, well, you know, I'll try something else, people are saying, no, 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 no. We've, we, <laughs> we've been there. And there were no farm advisors. My dad was a farm advisor, all right? And we know what kind of advice farm advisors give and what people, and whether people listen to them. Because um, he would come back from farm center meetings going, you know, they're not listening to me. And so finally he did this. He would take a shotgun. <clears throat> I'm not making this up. He'd have to go to farm center meetings way in southern San Benito County. You know, it's bitter water down there. Farmers came in for the meetings at about 637. They had already eaten. They'd gotten up at 4 in the morning. So they're ready to go to bed. <clears throat> so he takes a shotgun. He puts it on the lectern. Um, and he just leaves it there. And of course, everybody's, the hell's he going to do with a shotgun? So they're fixed on the shotgun. He, meanwhile, I helped him. He loads, he unloads the, the birdshot out of the shells and puts confetti in the, in the, in the, in the, in the shell. So that then, at, toward the end of the meeting, when everybody was starting to go to sleep, he'd pick up the shotgun and fire at the ceiling. Um, and confetti would go all over everywhere. Um, and then he could get to the rest of the meeting before anyone would, um, um, would fall asleep. And um, that's all they remembered. Years later, they'd say, oh, yeah, I remember Rocky. He, Fired off a shotgun. I have no idea what he was talking about, but um, <laughs> a feeling which I share with him uh, continually. All right. So the potato bust comes, goes, wheat comes. So what we're going to need in order for this to work, we're going to need labor. If, it's, if you're going to diversify and get smaller, going to need labor, going to need transportation, and those are probably the two biggies. Chinese show up here in 1868 and cruise. Um, and, they're, and they're working in the wheat. But their availability makes it possible then for ag to begin to diversify. Some of the crops are actually uh, inspired by the Chinese. So you get Chinese come in 68, so that begins to solve the labor issue. The railroad comes, well, it doesn't really come. You see, <laughs> Watsonville has, sometimes has a great difficulty making up its mind. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but that's something that seems to be a tradition. So here we go. Railroad comes out of Gilroy, comes down across this very same river, comes on this side of the river over here. Here's the road. So it comes down here, and this is Southern Pacific Railroad. And Southern Pacific says to the town, it's 1871, to talk to Wasmo, says, you know, we'll come back across the river if you'll pay for the trestle and give us a... Uh, you know, acreage for a depot. And Watsonville said, well, well, we'll have a meeting about it. Well, the meetings went on and on and on. And Southern Pacific finally said, to hell with you. Um, made a big left turn, went to Salinas, said, we don't need you. Um, and Watsonville's standing there going, eh, just a little late, a little short on the, on the draw, all right? So it's going to require them to get a railroad eventually of their own. This kind of solves it because there'll be eventually a good bridge here. So you can take agricultural products from over on this side and get them to the railhead. Because prior to 1872, it's all by ship. It's all by sea. Um, so the railroad opens it up. And then in 1876, the railroad will come through from Santa Cruz. Um, the railroad that you now own, congratulations. Um, you actually, I don't know if you know this, but you've now had a chance to pay for it twice. Uh, because in 1874, they passed a Bond Act to subsidize the construction of it. This is a twice-bought railroad. Um, and, and if you wait long enough, you may be able to pay for it again. <laughs> They're building trestles out there. We're going to try. So, OK. All right, so the railroad comes through. And we're going to talk about that, because we're going to go on a, on, a, on a little walkie poo. OK, those conditions make it possible um, for agriculture to begin to diversify. There's lots of exper experiments. Lots of different crops come in. Most of them don't take. Marco Rabasse shows up in 74. Um, and he's given, and they'll tell you about this, um, a chance. Now, Klaus Spreckels is one little flirtation right here. And we need to mention him because this is important for our walk. Spreckels shows up in 1888. He has a summer home over in Aptos. And he says, I'm going to build the largest sugar beet manufacturer in the world here. 
what do you give me? <laughs> and and it, because that's what they always said. They subsidized him by giving him the uh, acreage for the, the factory, and they also gave him uh, commitments to grow enough sugar beets. So sugar beets will be 10 years, 88 to 98. The sugar beet acreage went south. Sugar beet's a marginal thing, can, can grow in marginal soil. You know, Paro Valley is some of the best agricultural land in the world. Um, sugar beets, it's like driving a Ferrari in low gear all the time. Uh, sugar beets, not a good crop for this place. So the sugar beets began to move south, and as they did, um, Spreckles had to ship the sugar beets into the plant um, from Moro Coho and then eventually from the Salinas Valley. So eventually he moved the mill. He moved the mill in 1898 to Spreckles. Um, Salinas, same story. He went to Salinas and said, hey, you want a sugar beet manufacturer? And Salinas guy said, doesn't this smell kind of bad? Um, I don't know, we need to have a meeting. <laughs> so, they, so they had a meeting and couldn't come to any agreement, and he said, to hell with you. And he built the plant way out on the, on the south side of town in Spreckles. Um, but that flirtation with sugar um, was really important for transportation and for infrastructure development, which, uh, which they'll talk about. One of the ways you can, you can know what the local commodity of, of movement was, was the baseball team, the local professional baseball team in the 1890s was known as the Sugar Beets. That was the name of the team. They had a Sugar Beet. City of Watsonville had a Sugar Beet on its city logo. Now it's got some lame old bird. Um, but uh, you know, in the old days, it had just a cluster of Sugar Beets right there on their chest. But when Spreckles went away, the Sugar Beets went away, they changed and the team name then became the Watsonville Pippins. I'll give you a clue. Um, Hollister has always been the hay balers. Um, there was a hay balers from the beginning. I wear my hay baler buckle. My therapist says I have to. Um, it's part of my therapy um, from having grown up in, um, in, 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 okay. Last bit, last bit of story here, just to explain the context of this. Up until 1875, there were no immigration laws. You could come in even if you were just warm. You didn't even have to be alive. Um, starting in 1875, the United States government passed a law. The very first law to restricting immigration was restricting against women who might become prostitutes, believe it or not. I'm not sure how they were, what test they used for that. Um, I, I don't know, you give them a questionnaire? Uh, I'm not sure. So starting in 1875, they begin to restrict 1882 is a biggie because that's when they restricted the Chinese. That's the first and only time in the history of the United States when a people were, were um, actually excluded by race from coming to the United States. So, and then in 82, after 82, it just begins to tighten down. And what eventually happens is the United States government decides that they want Northern and Western Europeans. They don't want people from Eastern Europe or from over there. Um, they don't seem to mix, and, and they speak funny languages, and their food smells funny, and it's not, it's not you know, we, we need to fix that. Um, so they passed the immigration quota law. The first one was in 18, uh, excuse me, 1921, but this is the biggie. You, this is the National Origin, Origins Quota Act 1924, which pretty much tells you the value judgment that the United States government has about its immigrants. Um, and you can see that Germans, Brits, and Irish pretty much ruled the roost here. Um, and that's nationally per year. That's not in Watsonville. This is for the whole country. Um, so each year, 51,000 Germans could come in and 671 Yugoslavs could come in. To give you a sense, I think, of how the United States government looked at this, that percentage holds until 1952. All right. Now, you're immediately thinking back in your family tree and going, how did great grandma, what? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that as to how they may have um, beyond, beyond the quota. But this gives you a sense. Uh, Spain, Greece, 100. But, you know, and of course, China and Japan had no quota at all, none. They couldn't come to the United States after 1924. And there's a war in 1941 too which you may remember vaguely, um, that a lot of that comes out of this. Um, the Japanese, uh, their feelings were 
pretty badly hurt in 1924. Okay, so immigration after 24 squeezes, and the last one, they also passed what is known as the Cable Act. Starting in 1907 until 1922, if an American citizen married an alien, in other words, if somebody that was, how do you get citizenship in the United States? Be born here. That's one. If you're born here, you're an American citizen. Doesn't matter what your parents are. All right? That's still the law. And everybody grumbles about it periodically. They've always grumbled about it. You're nothing new. Everybody grinds their teeth and goes, ah, yeah. well, you need to know. It goes all the way back to 1790. People born in the United States are citizens. Right? The other way would be, be, be able to naturalize. Well, the naturalization laws varied from place to place. A lot of it had to do with literacy. But if you were, say, an America-born Croatian, and there was a woman brought in who was an alien, um, you would lose your citizenship if you married her before she naturalized. I want you to think about that. You would lose, it didn't matter. Didn't matter if she wasn't born here, if she was an alien and she hadn't naturalized and you were an American citizen, between 1907 and 1922, you lost your citizenship. Henry Mello's mother um, w was part of this. She was an immigrant, married Henry's dad, who was a citizen. She lost her citizenship. She had to naturalize. And when she went to the naturalization ceremony, Henry was there. This is when he was a state senator. Henry was there. His mom was going through the process. And there's a thing where you have to swear allegiance to the country of your birth. She held up her hand, and the judge said, well, you have to swear. And she said, I can't. I was born in the United States. No, I mean, oh, wait, let, me, let me turn that around. How did, what did I, I had that backwards. I was born. Yeah, it was the other way around. Right. She's America born, he's the immigrant, she loses her citizenship when she marries him, she has to naturalize. She has to renounce the country of her birth, she can't. Then she explains to the judge, I can't. I was born here, it's known as the Cable Act, and she did a little speech where she educated the judge, I don't remember. Might have been a Croatian named judge, could, could have been. Um, I, sorry, dude, um, he's up there. Um, so, these, this is the frame. And what we're going to do, we've got these uh, two lovely young women who um, have done something that no one else could do. How many of you have a copy of their book? Donna, Donna was a colleague of mine at uh, Cabrillo for a, a gazillion years. Um, was a student of mine, as a matter of fact. But she, she, she was, you know, I was 12 and she was 10 and, you know, that was, <laughs> we don't know. And, and Kathy, who comes from the business side of the, of, of the animal and, and has been very good at doing the economic part of it, as you'll, as you'll see, um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the girls, Kathy and Donna. Kathy and Donna. And let me, let's put this. So, um, Dobro Došli, to those of you with Croatian grandmothers who know that that means welcome. And for everyone else, welcome to Behind Packing House Doors, Voices of the Croatian Community. My name is Kathy Mekas Miller. Um, my sister Donna Mekas and I are going to start this morning by telling you how we became interested in the Croatian story, and then we'll jump into that story with lots of slides. Don and I are granddaughters of immigrants, Croatian immigrants, to um, Watsonville. Our grandfather and grandmother um, immigrated here in 1901 and 1914, respectively. Our father, Andrew Mekas, was born in the Croatian colony here in Watsonville over on Ford Street in 1920. The two of us were raised in Santa Cruz. But every Sunday, we're in Watsonville at a family house where Croatian is the language of the day. And we grew up thinking that everyone had family who spoke two languages and frequently visited relatives' ranches or were in apricot cutting sheds um, and ate foods with names like 
kupas and kabasitsa and makarula. Growing up in this world was our starting point for the story that we're going to tell you today. And actually, Donna's going to start with just a little bit of history that relates to our friend Sandy. Good morning, everyone. So in 1979, I'm actually going to give it a date. In 1979, I was a student of Sandy's History of Santa Cruz County class, and I wrote a brief paper on our family's Croatian background for his class. And that went, that's what got us rolling with this whole project. But nothing developed for a long time after that. For the next 20 years, every time I would see Sandy, he would say to me, when are you going to write the Croatian story? Someone's got to write the Croatian story. And that literally went on for 20 years. At a dinner with George Howe Jr. one night in the summer of 2003, the subject of the Croatian book came up, and George said, if you write the book, I'll publish it. Kathy was at dinner with us that night and said, Donna, if you want to work on this project, I'll help you. And then my late husband, Morton Marcus, added, if you write it, I'll help edit. At this point, the book was faded. I mean, how do you get out of that, you know? Um, so after six years of research, my sister Kathy and I wrote our book about the immigrants who came from the Dalmatian coast of Croatia to the Pajaro Valley. Through our research, we accessed over 200 sources, both here, both here and in Croatia, and we interviewed over 30 senior members of Watsonville's Croatian community. <coughs> Through this project, we learned of the significant confusion about who these people were, because those in the room who are Croatian, they ca all call themselves Slavonians um, here in Watsonville rather than Croatians, and we learned about the influence they had in the development of Santa Cruz County. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that issue of why they call themselves Slavonians and why today it's Croatian, and there's, it's all very political. We also became far more knowledgeable about the many different ethnic groups who settled here, particularly in the South County, over the past 160 years. We began to understand how all of their differing worldviews, experiences, and visions contributed to this community. But today we're going to focus on just one of these groups, Watsonville's Croatians. So how many of you are familiar with names like Olaga, Skuric, Letnic, Resetar, Marinovic, Kraj, and Gizdic? Pretty, pretty common names in this, in this town and in this county. How many of you know that in the 1920s and 30s, more than 20% of Watsonville's population was Croatian? More than 20%. Two of the most visible reminders of the influence the Croatians had in the Pajaro Valley are right here on Main Street, and we're going to be looking at some of those buildings later today. This is the Letnich building on the corner of Main and Beach Streets. It was built in 1914 by M.N. Letnich and his cousin Mateo, both from Konavle, Croatia. Another landmark building, this is the Resetar Hotel on the corner of Main and West Lake. It was built in 1927 by three of the four Resetar brothers who came to Watsonville, also from Konavle. So who were these guys, and how is it that they came from Croatia to Watsonville? And where did they get the money to build these buildings? This is the story we're going to be telling you today. But let's start off with a map, um, just, just to make sure everybody knows where Croatia is today, um, because there's been a lot of movement in the last 20 years. Um, so everybody knows Italy, and this is the Adriatic Sea right next to Italy, and the whole red-lined area is Croatia. And it's, I think, important to note that Dubrovnik is right here at the very southern tip of Croatia, because most of the folks who came to this area are coming from that region, that very, very southern tip down there. Um, Dubrovnik isn't just a city, it's a geographic region which surrounds the city. So just so you know when you're over there, it is a city, but it's also a region. And if you take a look at the, dar the dark black line, everything to the west of that black line is considered the Dubrovnik region. It's a small region, 75 miles long and 20 miles wide. It also includes the coastal islands along this portion of the Adriatic coast. As you can see, it's including all of these islands. The vast majority of Croatians who came to Watsonville came from this Dubrovnik region. We do think it's important to give you some historical background to better understand the later efforts 
of the Croatians in Watsonville. This is a 17th century painting of the city of Dubrovnik. It shows you what the city would have looked like in the 1600s when it was an important international trading center and an independent city-state called the Dubrovnik Republic. This republic lasted for 700 years, from 1100 to 1808. I always like to remind people to think about how long the United States has been around in comparison. Um, you know, seven, 700 years, this is, this is just, because it looks where the next, you know, it looks the same today. Um, this is Dubrovnik today, um, and it, it really doesn't look a whole lot different than, the, than that 17th century painting. This is a shot from the town walls looking down the main street. Uh, the main street is called the Stradun over there, and this is the Franciscan Monastery right here on the left. Understanding Dubrovnik's relationship with Turkey and the Ottoman Empire is critical to understanding the Croatians' background in international shipping and trade. So I'm going to give you a few pointers here on how that all happened. In 1373, we're going to go all the way back to the 14th century, 1373, Pope Gregory IX gave Dubrovnik permission to trade with the Ottoman Turks. That was a big deal because at this time other Christian countries, which included all of the rest of Europe, were not allowed to trade with the Muslim world. So they couldn't send ships in and out, um, and Dubrovnik was the only city allowed to go in and out of, of that whole Turkish empire. This agreement cr created a link between East and West, and Dubrovnik became a wealthy international trading center where tradesmen honed their skills and were the middlemen delivering goods between the Western world and the Ottoman Empire. So there's all those people in the West that still want those the things that they want from Turkey, the silks or the, you know, whatever they're wanting and vice versa. They're, they're wanting the trade, but it's all happening through the city of Dubrovnik. I was, I want to tell you a little bit about this photograph. I was allowed to take this photograph in the Dubrovnik archives in 2008. It's a rare Turkish manuscript documenting the first demand for tribute from Mehmet II of the Ottoman Empire to Dubrovnik in 1458, just five years after the fall of Constantinople. And I was amazed that they just let me go in with a camera. They knew that I was working on a book, um, and I had people with me that they knew, but they just allowed me to take the photograph. It's one of the oldest documents they have in the archive. Dubrovnik's international shipping fleet boasted 300 ships in the 1500s, rivaling Venice in shipping throughout Europe. 18 of their ships were part of the Spanish Armada. Between 1200 and 1800, for 600 years, Dubrovnik was a diverse cosmopolitan port city. There were people doing business from all over the world and speaking many languages. In his play Twelfth Night, Shakespeare describes Dubrovnik as the ideal city-state. Most of Watsonville's Croatian, Croatians came from the rural areas and the islands of the Dubrovnik Republic. The majority came from Konavle but there are many other places, so I don't want to insult those in the audience where families came from other places, but if you take a look at numbers, the, the majority were from Konavle. And this is what Konavle looks like today. It's still a very agricultural, ag agricultural and rural area. This is a painting dated around 1900, showing people from Konavle wearing their traditional dress and dancing the kolo, a Croatian round dance. This is a photo of a traditional family house taken, believe it or not, in 1954. It looks ancient. This is a 54 photograph taken in Konavli, and this is the, um, the Banats, Banats over there, you would say, the Banats family house. The first thing that you notice about this house is how big it is. The largeness of this house, however, is not related to the family's wealth, but it's symbolic of a cultural tr tradition from this region. For centuries, people from Konavli lived in large family communities called Zajednice. These large families included up to 30 members, and they developed very strict roles for each individual's responsibility and behavior. These large family units had organized for survival, and family members worked together as a single social unit. The culture of the Zajednice would prove to be extremely important for the Croatians' economic success in the Pajaro Valley. And you're going to see how this, I want you to remember this, the way that they all lived in this sort of group home, if you want to call it that, because it's really going to play out in the rest of the story. Then, in 1808, this republic, with all of its government, laws, and history came to an end, 
Napoleon's troops, as part of his invasion of European countries, entered Dubrovnik, took over the city, and destroyed the Republic. So r right after this happens, this, I'm going to give you a few pointers here on what's going on right after this. The shipping trade was completely destroyed. The shipbuilders on the islands and the farmers in the countryside were starving to death. People heard news of gold in California. Hundreds of boys and young men began migrating to California, most between the ages of 16 and 20, and they spoke no English. More than half of the young, this, this, this quote, this, more than half of the young male population from the villages of the Dubrovnik region immigrated to America. More than half of their young male population. And many of them came right here to the Pajaro Valley. Here are some who left. Uh, these, are the, uh, these are the Alaga men. This is photograph is 1905 from the village of Bani in Konavle. Seven of them would leave and come to Watsonville. And some were left behind. This is Anton Resitar from Chilipi, Konavle. Four of his sons would leave for Watsonville and later build the Resitar Hotel, but he stayed home. This is Ivo Skurich. How many of you know the Skurich name, a huge name in Watsonville? This is Ivo Skurich on the far left with two of his friends. There were 12 siblings in the Skurich family, 12, and eight of them came to Watsonville. Ivo was the, one of the Skurich brothers who stayed in Croatia, and this photograph is from the 1940s. This is a shot of immigrants leaving from Kolochep, an island just off Dubrovnik, in 1910, and they're all heading for America. Like everyone else, the Croatians came to California in large numbers for the gold rush. This is a shot of the San Francisco Harbor. It's 1851. By 1850, just 38 years after the destruction of the Dubrovnik Republic, there's a small Croatian community in San Francisco on Davis Street. These early immigrants arrived from Europe by ship traveling around the Horn of South America. But by 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad was connected from the East Coast to California, so it became far easier to cross the country. By 1870, there are 250 Croatians living in San Francisco. Some Croatian men found work in the mines, but far more found opportunities in service industries where they formed partnerships and worked in groups and worked in groups. They worked in the restaurant industry, in coffee houses, and as fruit merchants. Some of you may be familiar with one of these early San Francisco Croatians. How many of you know, have heard of the name John Tadic, or the, know the name Tadic? Um, he was the one of the early owners of the historic Tadic Grill restaurant. Today, it's the oldest restaurant in San Francisco. In 1871, Tadic traveled from the island of Var in Croatia to New York. He then rode the Transcontinental Railroad from New York to California, less than two years after it opened. Two other extremely entrepreneurial Croatians who lived in this early San Francisco colony were Marko Rabasa, who San Sandy was talking about this morning, and Luke Srezovic. This is a photograph of Luke Srezovic. We do not have a photo of Marko Rabasa, and we wish that we did, but we thus far have not found one. They both experienced San Francisco's economic explosion in the late 1860s. By 1876, Marko Rabasa and Luke Srezovic are doing business in Watsonville. This is what Watsonville would have looked like to them at the time. When they arrived, there were already 47,000 fruit trees in Santa Cruz County. However, 20 years later, by 1891, there would be 307,000. Kathy's going to explain how this came about. As Donna just explained, Croatians by tradition had been international traders. All of the art is, has boats in it. <laughs> the Croatians who immigrated to California in the wake of the gold rush held on to their heritage as traders. Rather than heading to the gold fields, they were much more likely to find their opportunity in providing goods and services uh, to San Franciscans, where in um, those early years, 18 of the first 29 restaurants or coffee houses were Croatian-owned. They kind of had the field. 
Another of these Croatian-dominated services was bringing fresh produce into the city. By the, need, by the um, mid-1870s, the need for fresh produce in San Francisco reached the Pajaro Valley. And I love this colored shot of Main Street in Watsonville, where, as Sandy explained, by the 1870s, the great tracts of the Mexican land grants had been sold in the 1860s, and they were in grain crops by the 1870s. Watsonville's population had grown from about 50 at the time of the ranchos, right before the split up, of, split up, and uh, to about 2,000. But little fresh produce had made its way out of Santa Cruz County. The first Croatian immigrant to deal in fresh produce in Watsonville was Marco Robison. He'd been brokering fruit in San Francisco that he had purchased from the orchards of San Jose. But in 1873, Red Scale wiped out nearly all of the young orchards in the Santa Clara Valley. So Robison, like the man in this photo, dro drove a little farther south, hoping to find um, orchards. And indeed, in the Pajaro Valley, he found family orchards. Um, he proceeded to collect fruit and carry it back by wagon every day to San Francisco because that that was the only source of fruit for the, for the burgeoning San Francisco. It set the tradition in the Pajaro Valley. Here, growers don't look for distributors. It's the distributor who's looking for expansion among the grower. The early distributors discovered that if they promised to purchase all of the fruit in an orchard, the grower would have enough security and enough financial incentive to plant more orchards. Now, pre-purchase contracts had just begun and they'd been used um, for the wheat and for sugar beets, but it appears that the Croatian distributors were the first to offer a specific purchase price for apples and other fruits based on the health of the orchard and the number of blossoms on the trees. This. Here we have a, this might be, we got, we've got a guy in this orchard looking at these blossoms. And what he's doing is evaluating is what he's going to pay for a crop that he can't even see yet. So this was a future contract. And this type of future contract was called a blossom contract. And an even riskier practice emerged. A promise to pay a specific price for the next eight years based on today's blossoms. This is what Marco Robisa did. The, the late 19th century Pajaronian goes nuts. They say that this practice is just crazy. And, and you certainly wouldn't find anyone today who would predict a commodity price eight years out, I'm gonna pay you for your crop for the next eight years. But orchards, production did indeed expand. Um, quickly into this outlying area with this promise of crop payment up front. The Croatian immigrant businessmen took this risk because of their desire to succeed in this country. They saw the possibilities that were possible in the Pajaro Valley. By the mid-1880s, the scale of fruit shipments that were being sent to San Francisco by Rabasa and Srezovic attracted more Croatian fruit merchants who were in San Francisco to relocate into Watsonville. Some who came at this time were M.N. Letnich, F.P. Marinovich, Luke and Stephen Skurich. The growth of the apple harvest also encouraged Luke Srezovich to set up the first on-site packing house in Watsonville in 1884. Here you could own your own land and make all of the profit. The Croatians were still really wary, though. Because of politics in the homeland, they never, and those in the audience will know this because you grew up with this, they never lost their fear that the government would confiscate either their land or their business or both. 
So under the wire, a whole culture that's, that's trying to live under the wire. As orchard production grew, there was more demand for labor. This took place just as the Chinese immigrant labor force that was here was being restricted. And I, I love having this photo of the Chinese working on the roadbed at the time. As a result of reduced labor, the brokers began recruiting newly arrived Croatian la laborers from the families that they knew in San Francisco. These laborers quickly caught on that a single man living frugally could save enough in two years to lease his own 10 acres of land. In, in two more years, he could open a small packing business or maybe he could purchase that 10 acres of land. Talk about a huge incentive. These are men for, from a country where for centuries, the purchase of land for all but the noble class had been restricted by law. Um, the letters home start offering jobs. They're, the letters say there's work and you've got a future in Watsonville. So offering extended family and neighbors and friends from the old country a job became routine. The job offers began to come with paid passage. So by the time we get to this photo in um, 1910, most of the people boarding this boat um, in Kolachep would be coming with a place to stay and a job that they know that they're coming to. Seated is Luke Seacuth, who became a um, major apple grower in this area. This is 15 years after his arrival. And I have this wonderful quote from him. He says, I heard about California. That was all you heard about back home. Families were always riding back and forth. As far as the United States, we hardly ever thought about it. But California was always in our minds. By 1889, there were four small packing houses in Watsonville. This is the Alaga packing business. Then there were nine. This is the Stolich early packing business. Then there were 30, then 50, then more than 80 families involved in apple picking business in her, here in Watsonville. This is a larger um, Stolich packing operation, and, and I love this picture because as soon as you look at it, you know that everybody here is involved in this. Grandma's involved, the young children are involved. This, this is a collaborative effort of the family. Um, in Croatia, you had at least 20 extended family members at a time regularly organizing into some kind of production chain for whatever the goal of the day or the month of the, or the year was. The Croatians in Watsonville organized into working groups to perform every job necessary to form a vertical production chain for fresh produce. Um, we're talking that from the growing to the packing, the, the excuse me, growing, picking, packing that we see here, to transporting. Um, this one is Joe Boric at the Reigns, if people know the Boric family. Um, on to sorting. This is the Rilovich um, packing business. On to marketing for presentation. On to marketing for brand recognition. And finally, to shipping internationally. Each of these steps was organized within the family business. This one is Stephen Knego at the Reigns. The packing houses became larger. Here's a much larger Alaga packing operation than we saw from those early photos. This is a picture from the 1930s of um, a row of packing houses. And it's interesting to note a practice that started in the 1890s but went all the way through the mid-century. Um, the various Croatian families competed with each other but they still set up business right next door to each other. So we have in this photo, Stolich, Zupan, I think we say Zupan now, Barina, 
Jornich, Kalich, Lukrich, Letnich, Borkovich, Dragovich, and Brekovich, all, all in a row. But what they couldn't do was solve the problem of insect damage. It destroyed nearly 50% of their crop annually. They tried tar, whale oil soap, elixirs that burn the leaves off of trees. It would be this student entomologist, William Volk, and his counterpart, E.E. E. Luther, who came on loan from UC Davis to do this job. And this lab, was is the building is still there. It's right across from Watsonville High School. Um, it would take these guys years, but they would develop a compound and a system that was effective, yet gentle enough to be routinely sprayed. The outcome for Volk and Luther and a handful of financial backers was the development of the Ortho brand right here in Watsonville. Now, before spraying, the Croatians had been able to increase production of fruit in the Pajaro Valley 40 or 50 times by the turn of the century, up to 500,000 boxes annually by 1898. By 1903, that was 2,500,000 boxes from a town of 2,500 people. After the development of routine pest control, this more than doubled again. So that by 1909, there's so much business in Watsonville, local business decides to, op uh, to set up an annual fair. It's called the, annual, the Apple Annual, and it was modeled on exhibits from the San Francisco 1894 World Fair and Exhibition. This is an Apple Annual Parade photo um, on Main Street. Um, and what I want you to log away about this photo is the, the Apple Wagons, if this wasn't the Apple Annual, they would not be going down Main Street. But what they would be doing is coming down Lake Street or Ford Street. And during harvest season, this parade photo is exactly what you would see on Lake and Ford. They're coming every few minutes all day long during harvest season. This is just a little portion of what you would see um, coming into the apple packing sheds. During the Apple Annual, special buildings were built. Thousands of people from all over the country came in by train load in, here into Watsonville. Um, this is an Apple Annual display, and um, it's fun because let me get up. This, this is the whole world, and it's made of apples. And this is the old high school, and it's made of apples. And to give you a sense of the size of this building, these are the folding chairs, so now you, you get a sense of how big these <laughs> apple displays are. <laughs> the economic outcome of this story has, became, has become famous through Jack London's descriptions of the Slavonian apple growers of the Pajaro Valley in his 1913 novel, The Valley of the Moon. In the novel, a farmer named Benson is talking to a young married couple he's picked up in his wagon uh, coming over Hecker Pass on the way into Watsonville. And here we've got Hecker Pass at about that time. In the following excerpt, Benson is marveling at the accomplishments of the Croatians while at the same time taking it for granted that Croatian immigrants are inferior to real Americans. Benson says, wait till we strike the Pajaro Valley. I'll show you what can be done with the soil by uneducated foreigners that the high and mighty American has always sneered at. I'll show you. It's one of the most wonderful demonstrations in the state. Think of it, 12,000 acres of apples. Do you know what they call the Pajaro Valley now? New Dalmatia. They were miserable immigrants. First, they worked at day labor in the fruit harvest. Next, they began in a small way, buying the apples on the trees. The more money they made, the bigger became their deals. 
Pretty soon, they were renting the orchards on long leases, and now they're beginning to buy the land. It won't be long before they own the whole valley, and the last American will be gone. <laughs> These Adriatic slabs are long-headed in business. Not only can they grow apples, but they can sell apples. No market? What does it matter? Make a market. That's their way. While our kind let the crops rot knee-deep under the trees. Why? Those Dalmatians are showing Pajaro, Val Pajaro apples on the South African market right now. There's the valley now. Look at those trees. Look at those hillsides. <laughs> That's New Dalmatia. Look at it. An apple paradise. So the Croatian apple industry was a dominant player in the national market into the 1930s and, and still a strong player into the 1960s when Donna and I were spending our childhood Sundays at family farmhouses in the orchards. Already by 1890, the apple districts in Oregon, Washington, and, and eight other states had caught on to the distribution methods, um, the methodology that had been developed by the by Pajaro Valley's Croatians. This is a, a recitar packing shed, and although this is a photo from the 30s um, with, a, with an actual conveyor belt, this is later, it, you do get a sense that the idea was these various distribution stations where you could get um, your fruit out in a very um, fast fashion. The Croatian apple industry reached its peak between the two world wars. Um, experimentation, by that time, experimentation had begun in other but related fields of work. They'd already been producing and distributing crops other than apples, and, and by World War II, they had expanded into any affiliated field, into real estate, banking, trucking, cold storage, packaging, and the provision of agricultural supplies. Now I'd like to pass back to Donna, and she's going to tell you what daily life was like for these Croatian immigrants and how they maintained their cultural identity while simultaneously integrating into life in the community here in Watsonville and Santa Cruz County. So what was life like for these early Croatians? Even though some Croatian immigrants were financially successful in Watsonville's early years, like Mateo Letnic in this photo, there were far more who worked, for the, who worked for the wealthier Croatian families as laborers and scraped by as best they could, like the farm workers shown here. For those working in the apple industry in the early days, the work was long and hard. Everyone was up at 5 a.m. to begin their day pruning and spraying the apple trees. At that time, mustard plants grew tall beneath the apple trees and the yellow foliage would be wet with fog or rain in the mornings. As a result, the pants legs of the orchardist's trousers would be soaked and they would remain wet all day. Many of the men developed arthritis in their knees and ankles early on from working in these conditions. The men would also come home from work covered with yellow dust from the toxic pesticides they were using to spray the trees. The jobs in the packing sheds were no easier. Women did most of the sorting. The sheds were not heated and the work was monotonous and unending. The women would heat bricks in their ovens at home and take them to work in the mornings. They would then stand on the bricks for warmth while they worked. Here's a 1929 map of Watsonville, where many of Watsonville's Croatians lived. They grew up around the apple packing sheds, the area from Ford to First and from Rodriguez to Walker. That doesn't mean that there weren't Croatians living in other places in Watsonville, but I would say that the, the largest mass living together was in this area, and for obvious reasons. Here are the railroad tracks, right here. And the packing sheds are all along the tracks, all up and down Walker Street. And everybody lived, many, many hundreds of families lived in that area. 
This is a photo of Wa the Walker Street Depot where we're going to be standing later today. A little bit later on, we're going to be standing out right out in front of that depot. And in this photo, it's great because we've got the old locomotive over here. You can just kind of see the action that's going on down there. And this is Walker Street between West Lake and West Beach showing the Railroad Exchange Hotel. This is one of the first uh, big Croatian hotels that's no longer standing, but I'm going to show you where it was. That's right down there on Walker Street. And it was built and run by the Strazicic family. The advantage of living so close together was that it facilitated the continual social visiting that was part of Croatian culture in the old country and continued here in Watsonville. Those who grew up in this community were pretty self-sufficient. They all grew their own gardens, raised chickens and rabbits, and often had a goat or a pig. But this same closeness is also why everyone knew everyone else's business. So keeping your good name, in Croatian your dobro ime, became essential. This is uh, the Miljanic brothers. For any of you know the Miljanic boys, this is, um, this is George Miljanic. He was a colleague of mine at Cabrillo for many, many years. And Kathy and I interviewed him. And he told us a, a little story about this idea of reputation. So this is a quote from George. When I was a kid, my father used to say, if you get your name in the paper because you've done something bad, you'll find your suitcase waiting for you on the front porch. In the Croatian community, your reputation was everything. But as a kid, I kept thinking, we're so poor we don't even own a suitcase. Where are my parents going to get this suitcase if I were getting to get into trouble? That's George's quote. And anybody that knows George, he's a pretty funny guy. Now I'm going to move on uh, to a story about Watsonville's Plaza on Main Street. Uh, this is an early slide of the plaza right around 1900. The person who took the photo is standing in the plaza looking at Beach Street on the right with Main Street in the distance. But I want you to notice something about this photograph. Everybody, how many of you today know where the mansion house is on Main Street? A few. Okay. Well, we're going to have more conversation about this because this is the mansion house right here on the corner and it's not there today. So we will be talking about why that building used to be on the corner and now it's not. But it's still down the street. But while we're on this um, photo of the plaza, um, I want to share another story with you about, about this, um, this park that's in the center of town. One of the people we interviewed um, before she passed away in 2004 was Mary Ferris. So this is a quote from Mary Ferris. In the early 1930s, when I was about four, my grandfather and I would frequently, frequently walk together from our home to the plaza on Main Street. We would spend time sitting together on a bench in the park, and my grandfather would take the time to point out all of the languages we could hear from where we were sitting. He would identify English, Croatian, Spanish, Italian, Chinese, and Japanese. My grandfather would identify the languages for me and have me listen so that I too would learn and hear the uniqueness of these languages. Continuing on with this theme of diversity, this is a, a photo that shows both Japanese and Croatian packers here. Um, this is 1911, and it's Mitchell Kalich's packing house. And Mitchell is the man standing right here, and he's holding the hands of his two children. Lucille is here, and Louis is standing up on the, pa on the apple box. And you see there are a large number of Japanese packers um, in this shot. Even though we know these Japanese packers are working for Mr. Kalich, this wasn't just a working relationship because we also know that 34 years later, during World War II, the Croatian Kalich family would travel all the way to Poston, Arizona to visit the Japanese Yagi family at the internment camp where they had, in quote, been relocated throughout the war. The Kalich family was also one of the Watsonville families who assisted their Japanese neighbors when they returned to the Pajaro Valley. Not everyone did so. Finally, I want to show you a few photos that will give you a glimpse into the cultural life of these immigrants. And we're going to come back to that first photo that was on the screen when you all arrived this morning. Um, this is um, this is the wedding of Louis Secondo and Mary Yerenich. The year is 1914. And this is what we call a packing house wedding, for obvious reasons. So I want you to take a look at what you're looking at here. Um, you're later today going to see a packing house that looks just like this. 
And clearly the day before they were all working. And, you know, in a few hours, you take all the apple boxes and pack them up against the side of the building. And take a look at these, this seating here. It's apple boxes turned on their heads with some redwood planks thrown down for seating. And the tables are made the same way. There's apple boxes, one at the bottom, two more on top, and then you've got planks that are put down. They put up a few streamers, and you have a wedding for hundreds. Back to work on Monday. <laughs> this is another packing house wedding photo. This is Peter Stolich and Helen Pekrovich. It's 1914 also. And on this one, just kind of notice that there, there's Croatian embroidery on the end of that tablecloth. And you see lots of bottles of wine. And we can assure you that that all, wine would have all been homemade. Everyone in this community is making all of their own wine and sharing it. And so it would have been homemade wine. Watsonville's Croatians maintained a strong sense of their own community and culture. They always turned out for weddings, funerals, and any chance for a social gathering. Um, this is a weekend gathering at the Copra Visas on San Juan Road in, in the 1920s. The two men on the left are our great uncles, Andro and Nico. Um, so these, this one is Andro and this one is Nico. And uh, how many of you know Nita Gistich? Um, this is Nita's dad. So Nita is our cousin. So, so this is um, our great uncle Nick and Nita Gistich's dad. And he is playing the guzla back there, which is a traditional musical instrument from Konavle, very specifically from our area of Croatia. This is a Croatian bar a beach barbecue in the 1920s. Croatians worked hard, but they always had time for a barbecue. This is a photo of a group of Croatian men barbecuing meat over an open fire down at the beach. And for those who don't know, meat is pretty much the mainstay of the Croatian diet. There's other things, but you have to have meat. <laughs> this is, and this is probably goat or lamb or a combination of the two. Uh, this is the backyard of the Bubic House on Ford Street in 1928. Um, I have to say this is probably one of our favorite photos because all of our family is in it. Um, this right here is our grandfather Marco who came in 1901 and our grandmother Kate who came in 1914 and our dad Andy born 1920, his sister Helen now Helen Estoya and Nick Mekas down here his little brother. And we've identified every single person in this photograph. We have all of the everybody identified. This is 1928. And this is the Miramar Bar, which was where all the Croatians hung out, literally from 1947, you know, into the 1990s. The, uh, the Miramar Bar, 526 Main Street. Um, there were three partners, Nick Durpich, Clem Ivalich, and Blondie Lusic. And really, it's, it's, you know, it's where everybody met on the weekends. It was really the social gathering, for the, uh, social, the place for the Croatians to gather. So... Now we're gonna get just a little bit serious to end this up. Um, after 48 years of steady immigration to Watsonville, directly from the Dubrovnik region to the Pajaro Valley, Croatian immigration was effectively stopped in 1924, as you heard Sandy referring to this morning. This took place as a result of the Na National Origins Quota Act, which allowed only a few hundred immigrants into the United States from the area of today's Croatia. Croatian immigration stopped because of anti-immigrant sentiments, particularly towards groups coming from Eastern and Southern Europe. By this time, immigration had already stopped for immigrants coming from Asia. One of the leaders of this anti-immigration movement was Francis Walker, a former president of MIT. What he said in an 1896 essay gives you a glimpse of what anti-immigration leaders were saying publicly about immigrants coming from Eastern and Southern Europe, including Croatians. He wrote, this is a quote, only a short time ago, the immigrants from Southern Italy, Hungary, Austria, and Russia together made up hardly more than 1% of our immigration. Today, the proportion has risen to something like 40% and threatens soon to become 50 or 60% or even more. The entrance into our political, social, and industrial life of such vast masses of peasantry degraded below our utmost conceptions is a matter which no intelligent patriot can look upon without the gravest apprehension and alarm. They are beaten men from beaten races, representing the worst failures in the struggle for existence. What effects must be produced upon our social standards and upon the ambitions and aspirations of our people by a content of so foul and loathsome? 
That was published, and that's the reason for the, um, the Immigration Act that happened in 1924. Francis Walker's sentiments were eventually successful in all but stopping immigration from areas of Southern and Eastern Europe. In closing, the Croatians were just one of the many immigrant groups who found a new life in America and have, con and have contributed to our nation's growth. All of the immigrant groups who have come to work in the Pajaro Valley have had a tremendous impact on the culture and economy of Santa Cruz County. It's this mix of histories, experience, and cultures that continues to be our uniqueness, our struggle, and our advantage. And with that, we're going to pass back to Sandy. So do you remember when we were looking at the slides this morning and we were taking a look at the mansion house that was on this corner right here? Well, the mansion house is now moved a block down the street. And the people who did that were M.N. Letnich and Matteo Letnich, two cousins. Um, M.N. came first to Watsonville um, in the late 1800s. And his cousin, who was significantly older and had been working up in Eureka in the, in the restaurant industry, he basically was saving his money up there and then came down and joined his cousin here. So they joined forces in Watsonville and they go to work. And by about 1890, they're opening up the um, Del Monte um, Fruit Ranch in Aromas and they're building their fruit empire. The, these are the Letnich cousins. Eventually, I'm going to tell you in time, they end up having businesses in five cities in California, Los Angeles, San Diego, here in Watsonville, San Francisco, I'm probably missing one, but they are really big time fruit uh, dealers. And so by the time we get to the, the, them wanting to build this building, they're getting so big. They have, in San Francisco, they have eight blocks of the fruit market and they're working with Giannini. I mean, they're working with the big boys up in San Francisco. So they come here, realize that they need to have a big building for their business, but they want it on the corner block. They want this corner. So they go to the mansion house and say, we'll move you. And they make a deal with the mansion house. And you're going to see it as we go along the corner. They, this is in 1911. So in 1911, if you could imagine what it would take to move a building, there, you know, you're, you're talking about horses and wedges and getting it up on you know, carriages and moving it down the street. It would have been a giant process. But they do it because they wanted the corner lot. So they move the mansion house down. They build the Letnich building in 1914. It's always been office buildings. And as I said, Matteo, uh, not Matteo, but MN was really, they called him the dean of the Apple industry. And in the, when Kathy and I were reading all, you know, all of the old Pajaronian newspapers, almost every day you'd be following what MN was doing. MN's in Los Angeles today. Oh, he's back from Los Angeles. Now he's heading to San Diego. He and his wife went to a concert in San Francisco last night. They followed every step that you did. So there's so much history that we were able to collect from the Pajaronian about these Letnich cousins. So they build the building, 1914. To see if there's anything else. In, in 1897, they shipped the largest carload of apples ever from the Pajaro Valley. It was 1,006 boxes to Denver. Um, so they're really working big time. And this is one of the big, big buildings. And that's where they get the money to build the building, this one. So this building, this building that's right across the street from us with the green awnings, not as gigantic as the Letnich building by any means, but there's some great stories around this building. So do you remember? Earlier today, when I was telling you about Mr. Kalich, the one who his family went to go visit the Yagi family in the internment camp and so forth, um, this is the Kalich building. Um, it was built by Mr. Kalich. He came to Watsonville in 1902, and he came directly to work as the foreman for the Letnich cousins. So Letnich cousins are already in here. Here, he's one of the young guys that comes to work for them, works up to become their foreman. And after a while, he goes, after about six years, he goes into business for himself and eventually does every aspect of the Apple industry. He's growing, he's packing, he's shipping. Eventually, he's on the bank board locally. Um, and then in 1925, he becomes the first city council member of Croatian descent in Watsonville. So for the rest of the community, that's a really big deal. It's the first time that somebody from their community actually is a representative on the city council. So he's somebody that is really doing a lot um, in the city. And I do, I'm going to read you one quote. Hold that for me for just a second. I have a great quote from Judge Franich. How many of you knew who Judge Franich was? You mean professionally or? 
who he was. Friendly. So, you know, Judge Frenich later on is a Superior Court judge here in Santa Cruz. And when he was an older man, he talked about Mitchell Kalich. And this is a quote from him. He said, Mitchell Kalich was the first alderman in Watsonville from the Yugoslav race. And I suppose this fact always left an impression on my young mind of growing up in a minority race and of this man who made it for all of us. So he was somebody very looked up to, um, even by someone like Judge Branich. And one more thing, his wife, um, Rose Kalich, um, she was a, the midwife for the Croatian community. Whenever there was not a doctor around, she was delivering all the babies in town. And then when the flu epidemic hit in 1918, she was 24-7 in the civic auditorium taking care of the, of the sick and the dying. Um, and her daughter, when we interviewed her, said that her parents constantly had a line of people out their door coming for help. Um, help with translations, help with trying to get a family member to this country, help with, you know, whatever. And she said they all of their lives, they tried to do their best to, to serve the rest of the Croatian community. So, to the Kalich family, who went to visit the Yagis. It has a blue, it has a blue plaque on it. Yep, blue plaque on it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And yet, you know, as Sandy knows, when you read history about these various people, it's amazing what comes across about personalities. The more you read, the more you get to know about different families and what they did um, and how involved they were in the community. And this is one that really stands out. Okay, so now you're standing in front of the historic Resitar Hotel. Um, you can see the old, the old address up there and, and so forth. We are going to be going in in a few minutes. But before we go in, I want to tell you just a little bit about the family. Um, if you again remember back to the slides this morning, I showed you the photograph of the older man in a traditional Croatian uh, dress, and he was the father who was left behind. So his four sons all came to Watsonville. There's um, Anton, Mike, Mitchell, and Louie. There are four of them. And Anton comes first in 1900, but he's not here long before he learns that his father is ill and has to go back to Croatia. So he then goes back. The second son, Mike, comes to San Francisco instead of Watsonville in 1901, and he starts saving money to send for his brother, Mitchell. So now we've got Mike and Mitchell in San Francisco washing dishes, is what they're doing. They're just boys. They're 14 and 16-year-old boys washing dishes in San Francisco. They then, in a couple years, save up enough money to open up the Eagle Rock Cafe in San Francisco. They open up. They've got their own lease. They're, they've got a restaurant going and just get it up and running when what happens in 1906? The earthquake hits. The entire restaurant's destroyed. The two young boys do survive. They get out. And we have a great interview of them later on in life saying that the two brothers spent the aftermath of the earthquake in a boat out in the San Francisco Bay, eating beans out of cans and watching the destruction of the city from the sea. So they, and again, they're you know 16-year-old boys. Their, their restaurant has just been burned to the ground. And they're out there, they saved a couple of cans of beans, and just, you know, they're out there watching the aftershocks. I think it's quite the visual story. So now they've lost everything. They, the, for the next three years, they're, they're migrant workers going up and down the state, doing whatever fruit picking they can possibly find. Um, in 1909, they actually get brave enough to approach Giannini in San Francisco, Bank of Italy, and ask for a loan to open up Resitar Brothers. So Giannini grants them the loan, obviously. Um, they come to Watsonville. They start opening up their Apple business, um, and it starts growing and growing. So it's only 18 years from the time they get the loan from Giannini before this hotel is built. For those of you in business today, if you can imagine opening a business and 18 years later, you have the money to build this hotel. So they're, they're doing this. It opens in June of 1924. And when we get inside, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what a big event this was for the whole city of Watsonville. It was a huge gala event when this hotel opens. Um, and I just want to see if there's anything else I want to see. So Mike and Mitchell, the two boys that were out on that boat um, eating beans out of a can in 1906, it's now 1926 and 1927, and they're building the hotel. It took one year and six weeks for them to build it from the time they broke ground until it was actually up and running. Um, it's, it was 100 rooms, and it opened June 4th of 1927. And when I say it was 
the, when I say it was the talk of the county, I want to read you, I'm going to read you two quotes from the Pajaronian. And I want to tell you, I went up to the UCSC library to look up old copies of the Pajaronian, which you can do at Cabrillo or UCSC or the Santa Cruz library, you can find them. But it's where I was looking. So the day before this hotel opened, there was an entire separate section of the Pajaronian that came out just about this hotel opening. And you had every business in town, mattress companies, furniture companies, lighting, saying congratulations to the Resitar brothers. And it was literally 10 to 20 pages thick. And I went through and started, you know, get, copying all of the articles that were said at the time. So these are a couple of things. The editor of the Pajaronian wrote, when, and this is the day before the opening of the hotel, it's decidedly heartening to witness the faith of the Resitar brothers in this city, to know that they have the faith that so many of us lack, and believe in its future progress and prosperity. They've been willing to gamble on their judgment and spend their own money here. And then a second uh, Pajaronian journalist wrote, this, this hotel will be a perpetual monument to the thrift, energy, and business acumen of the three men who about 25 years ago came to California from across the seas and immigrant boys to found the American branch of their family and become a financial power in the city of their adoption. And, and an inspiration to almost superhuman efforts like theirs on the part of a new generation of poor boys of humble origin. So this is what's being written in the Pajaroni at the time. So, and what was around you, um, there was a barber shop, there, was, there still is, barber shop, there was a beauty parlor, there was a coffee shop, there was a uh, cigar stand, and, I, and my sister and I love this, there was a men's writing room. I guess women didn't write in those days. Um, but there was a men's writing room in this building when it opened. So the day of the opening, there was a giant banquet and da dancing with many, many out-of-town guests. People came from as far away as San Francisco, Oakland, Santa Barbara. All of the big property owners were coming in for this gala opening that was happening um, on that June 4th date. We do know that Arthur Hyde was here. We know that Frank Castro of the, the, the Castro family, um, land grant family, was here. We know James Leask of Leask's department store, anybody who's been around for a long time, was here. And Mildred Wilder of Wilder Ranch was here. Um, and so it's, we, what, what we heard is it was just completely decorated in flowers and music and dancing and great big you know, banquet. And it was open to the public, of uh, the entire population of Watsonville all day with tours and food and things. But then it closed and it was an invitation only dinner that night. And they filled the hotel with out of town guests who stayed here overnight that night. So, you know, the, the, this is one of those stories that's just so astonishing when you think about a 14 and a 16 year old boy coming over, doing what they did, losing everything, starting over again, and then 18 years later they're building this hotel. Then eventually in 1970, Resitar Brothers becomes West Coast Farms and they are the biggest employer in the Pajaro Valley in the 70s. So it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger with time. Okay, um, questions? Um, in 1957, October, Alfred Hitchcock began to film the movie Vertigo over in San Juan Batista. There are no hotels in San Juan Batista then, hardly are now. So um, the crew from the film stayed here, as did one of the stars, Kim Novak, <clears throat> something I have a, an obsession with, according to my wife, um, stayed on the fourth floor, room 16. I happen to know that. Um, I'm sorry, but that's just you what it was. But she stayed. And, and I have to say, the thought, if you, stand, if you were standing across the street looking at this, um, it, it, I mean, it's a recitar hotel in Watsonville, right? Um, that Kim Novak stayed on the, I don't know, it just, the, the, the juxtaposition is just, um, um, and then eventually, of course, they made the movie, the movie came out the next year. Um, and you saw probably Kim Novak on the um, Academy Awards. Whew. Um, we, we, we followed her. I, I grew up in Hollister. We followed her around, but we never got a chance to see her because it was raining on that weekend. And um, so I got to see her on the Academy Awards uh, recently. And as my wife said, I won! Uh, you know, but that's, uh, you, you have to ask a woman about that. Okay, so go. So I, I, I just want to say, okay, before I get the question, I want you to realize how big this Apple industry was 
which is like, why would they be building a hotel that was this grand, if you can imagine you know, how grand it was? It's because this industry was so gigantic that there are people coming from all over the country to do business here. And it's a very different story than, you know, than what's happening in downtown Watsonville today, although it is happening in Watsonville, but more out in the country and not so much downtown. This, this, see, 33, okay. So there are many recitars still here. Um, I believe that, is, I, would it be fair saying that Bill is the patriarch of the family at this point? At this point, and his sister Anne Louise. So when when we found out they were going to renovate, we the first thing we said is contact Bill Resitar and show him the hotel because he probably hasn't been in it in a long time. And yes, you know, with every Croatian family, people ask us all the time, "Are there any Croatians left in Watsonville?" Well, probably I don't know how how many of us here today, but it's it's all the the children and grandchildren of the original immigrants. But many of the marriages are now mixed. It's like it's not all you know. It, Kathy and I are half Croatian and half other. And, um, and that it, that's the way it is for many of the families. No, my mother's godparents were the recitars, and my parents had their wedding reception here in 1932. And so I have some pictures of the ballroom. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. I love So anyway, we're gonna we're gonna do the, the railroad talk story um, to uh, see an apple packing shed and begin to get familiar with the shape. The quick version. <laughs> Remember, SP came around the corner along the Pajaro River through Aromas on the other side of the river, offered. Watsonville said, uh, let me think about it. And SP said, we're gone. And they went to Salinas. So you had a railroad to Pajaro Junction on the other side of the river. But you had to get stuff over the river. That was a bridge. So they built this. This was a narrow gauge. This originally, narrow gauge, four foot, actually 36 inches between the rails, coming around the corner, had a little trestle all of its own, uh, went across the river and connected. All right, that was the first version. S Southern Pacific eventually bought that. The original depot was over was just beyond the front of that truck. And then eventually the second depot was built here. Okay, now Klaus Spreckels brings the sugar plant, which is down the, uh, toward the end of this street, you know, at the end of Walker, which then will explain to you this extension that goes down, which not only goes to the beet sugar plant, but also will eventually serve the apple packing sheds that were down there as well. Okay, so here's the photograph I want you to see, and then we'll let the girls talk here. First of all, here's, this is an earlier one. This is 95, and this is really a cool picture because it shows all the economy. Oh, I got a hold still. Shooter says a hotel. So you can see the train, the passenger train coming in from Santa Cruz, which is that, that right by my finger there. And then apples being shipped out in the boxes to the extreme left. And then a line of sugar beet wagons going into the mill on the extreme right. So you got, you got sugar, apples, and passengers coming through this place. Busy, busy time, busy place. So we're at the corner of Walker and Beach Streets. And from the 1890s forward, um, this, is, this is growing and becoming more and more commercial. In fact, this is the most dynamic, vibrant corner in all of Santa Cruz County until the mid 20th century. A hundred years ago, at exactly a hundred years ago, 
um, there were 2,000 rail cars per month during harvest season departing from this corner. There are wagons bringing fruit from uh, down Lake, which is toward the foothills, and they're coming every few minutes in. There are, and they're coming to the packing sheds that are positioned near the railroad tracks here. Uh, there are wagons coming in a steady stream down Ford Street that have come out from Coralitas and along Freedom Boulevard. And our, our dad would tell the story of living along Freedom Boulevard and he'd say, you want to get to town? You just walk out to the street and every two minutes, here comes an wa apple wagon. You just hitch a ride on an apple wagon. That's what everybody did. So this is um, part of the busyness of this corner is, is also that you have businessmen coming to town. This is where you want to make your deal. So many businessmen coming to town that there's not enough rooms, there's not enough hotel rooms, hence the recitar being built. In the, in the 1920s, you already have hotels here, but it's just not enough. This is, um, th this is a, as Sandy said, a busy place. It's a smelly place. It smells like train and apples and manure. And um, the packing houses were built on both sides of these two streets. If you look around, you start to see peaked roofs behind us. Peaked roofs, down, peaked roofs, down the street, peaked roofs. I'm not sure if you can see down this street, peaked roofs. There were packing businesses that lined both sides of the street, and there was so much fruit going out of this corner, they, they extended this rail line to both sides of the street so they could load cars at the same time on both sides of the street. And this curved rail line that you see behind me here, um, it breaks into branches, maybe eight branches beyond where we can see. And that's so, I think you call it a spur. Each spur landed at the back of a different business so the rail cars could be loaded simultaneously in order to get that much fruit out each month. So lo loading on both sides of the street, loading down Beach Street, the packing houses themselves are filled with members of the community um, sorting and packing. The restaurants and bars are filled with sorting and packing. And that's the picture I want to leave you with for this corner is just how busy it was here. So. We're talking about the influence of the Croatians today. This entire block was Croatian owned all the way back 1890. Where that flagpole is today, you know, Kathy was talking about the need for hotels and the Railroad Exchange Hotel was built. So Railroad Exchange Hotel built right where the flagpole is. So he owned this whole part of the block. And then his brother gets here, Andrew Strazicic, and he owns, he, it's a restaurant a barber shop, a grocery store was all right here on the corner. So this whole block was and actually still is owned by the Strazicic family. Then this is the Del Monte. The Del Monte, for those of you who have been in town, this was the Del Monte Hotel. And it was in Croatian hands for almost 100 years. And the last owner, Peter Strazicic, is cooking dinner for us tonight. So a little later tonight, you're going to be getting the person who... Kovacic, I said the wrong thing, I'm sorry. Um, Peter Kovacic is going to be doing all the cooking. He came here in the 1960s as a child with his parents, and they ran the restaurant, and then Peter ended up taking over after him. So we're very fortunate that he's cooking for us tonight. This was the Brekovic packing business. Um, to give us perspective, the peak buildings we see over to my left are a part of the row of peak buildings that Sandy's holding up that we saw this morning when I was talking about the packing businesses all being in the row. That, that was right across the street, and those, pack, those buildings are part of that row that remain. Um, why, why the crazy expansion in packing businesses? Um, after about 1890, San Francisco was full of fruit. 
if you send more fruit to San Francisco, the price is going to go down. So profitability after 1890 became all about how do you quickly get fresh fro produce to a hub city so it can be sent to a secondary city. Um, and so and the, the organization of the packing house allowed that to happen in less than 24 hours. So in this particular building, fruit would have come in the backside and a call would have been made to uh, the Pajaro Yard asking for cars in the morning and in the morning the cars would be out front to, to load first thing in the morning and that is how all the packing businesses worked. Um, let's, take a, let's take a walk inside. I do want you just to stop for a minute to look at the construction that, the, that Paul just asked about that this, this construction allowed for a lot of open space and in this particular wonderful building we we see what how it was a hundred years ago the the old floorboards the industrial door that's behind me all still the same you can imagine a wedding in here right when we saw the wedding supper this morning you can imagine how you would shove all those boxes against the walls and have a wedding in here and we look up and what are we standing in front of but the safe of jp Brekovich. Um, and so it became obvious that whose packing shed this was, and we got in contact with um, Janet Brekovich, um, and she said, well, yeah, of course, the building is still in family hands, and, the, and I, I really love this story because we think we're talking about 100 years ago, but we're talking about the community that still lives here and has a stake in this community. I guess we'll start with the family history, and then I'll go into some of the packaging, what we've done over all these years. Uh, 91 years this year, started in 1923. Great-grandfather Peter Sombrilo, born in 1852, he married Stana Milaglav, um, and I met the Milaglav family. Tom Ninkovich helped us a few years back get a family tree for both sides, and that helped a lot. Um, so we went back to Croatia last year and visited the family for the first time ever for me. My dad had been there, been there before, my sister had been there before, and then Mary Pila was kind of our contact, and she passed away, so I had to start from scratch. And, uh, but we got it done. I mean, I was so happy to come into the house and have a glass of wine with some Brilo made wine with my cousins. So uh, he started, so 1852, um, he married Stana in, in 1900. In 1901, he had my grandfather. He, originally before that, though, in 1878, he came to Angel's Camp by himself, not married, and was looking for gold. This was his, uh, this was his mining candle here, and his pistole, his, uh, his handgun to protect himself. Um, this gusla, I'm not sure when it came, the first trip or second trip, he went back. He went back to Zostele, and then married uh, my great-grandmother, Stana Milaglav. If you look back behind you, that's the original sign of this original building, and it basically looked like this, and uh, yeah. So there's one more there's one more building like this that I know it's the back of uh, Stolich's over there that looks yep yeah, yeah it just looks just like this so this is how the company started this is our first location we now have 14 of them so my grandfather uh, came here in 01 they moved into Watsonville in 1911 and he started the company in 1923 so he was what 22 years old when he started it he was partners with a Scourge, uh who now have Scourge insurance insurance company in town. Their first, I think this is it, right, this is the first company ledger um, with the Sombrilo and Scourge name on it from 1923. In 1924, the Scourge then started their insurance company and split from Sombrilo and we were on, our, the family was on our own. I'll go back real quick to my, to my grandfather, or great-grandfather. He was the youngest son of that family, which means he can't stay in the house anymore. His older brother, Ivan, is still there, and his, not he's not, he's passed away, but his descendants, my cousin Vlaho, are from that, that lineage. They're still there. What makes him a pioneer, every one of these guys, they're, they're ready to start something new. You know, that's so you get that inherent uh, fire to just be an entrepreneur, I think is what's been passed on to me. Because of the fact he's moved, he, he, had, he moved out of Croatia and tried to find a better life. He did the same and started the company. He did the same and invented the clamshell. You know, so that... Me? Well, I'm, I'm doing part of this too. Yeah, the green one. We're, you know, we're working on all this stuff. Um, so we, we, we got to go to the cemetery, which, you know, we're all going to the cemetery. You know what I'm saying? 
I mean, that's a terrible thing to say. Yeah, but you're not staying. <laughs> no, I hope not. So does everyone see the name on this grave? Uh, we've been talking about the Letnich family a lot today. Um, so there are a few pointers that I want to give you before. We're just going to let you, in a while, we're going to let you roam around and just take a look at all the Croatian names that are all over. We'll tell you where to go. But one of the things that is unique in Croatia um, when they, when family members die, is that there are multiple family members in one grave. And that's the norm in Croatia, and that became the norm here in Watsonville as well. So when we're looking right here, this is Mateo Letnich. Um, he's here with his wife, Rose, his wife, Rose's mother, and his wife's sisters. And they're all in one grave. Everybody's together. So we've got, we've got one, two over here, three, four, five. There are seven people in this one grave. And that's completely normal. When you go to Croatia, um, I think, you know, traditionally, now they're being buried in coffins today, but for the longest time, they, you, know, you just wrap the body and they'd go, there'd be a very deep cavernous grave that would go down very deep and there was sort of shelving in there and you get, you're, you're in with the rest of your family. And it would just seem normal, you know, great grandfather's down there and then the next one's going in, the next one goes in and it's all your family. It's actually very environmentally correct, right? <laughs> so that's one of the things that we wanted to point out. So as you're going around looking at graves today, Many of them are in the, these mausoleums or crypts where you've got, you know, individual slots, but also you're going to see many, a single grave that's going to have five names on it. And that does really mean that there are five folks in that, in that grave. And that is very typically Croatian. Also, when you're looking around, if it tells you, look at where they're from, because some people will say that they're from Austria because Croatia, as you learned this morning, was under the Austrian Empire um, early on. And so people that came early on would have said Austria when they were really from Croatia. What is Croatia today? Other people said Yugoslavia. Other people, if they're from one of the islands, might say Korčula or Miet. Um, other people might say Dubrovnik. Other people might say Konavli. Well, they're all, it's, it's all the same people. So when other folks came into this area, they had no idea who these people were. You know, they, they didn't realize that this is all the same group of people. Take them for a walk. We're going we're gonna to take a walk down this. We, we call this the Avenue of the uh, Croatians right here because it's, it's <laughs> yeah. solid. We're just going to walk down this way, and we're going to meet back in the bus in about 15 minutes or so. Where we're going is to Gizdic, the Gizdic Ranch, what they call it, um, and where Nita Gizdic has developed yet another way to use to the, the, how you handle the fruit business, which was part of her heritage. She wants you to lost it. I've been parking cars all day. I've been waiting. May I introduce the one and the only, the infamous, the wonderful, Nita Gizzi. Yay! So we're going to walk out to the orchard, a very short way in the orchard. Okay? Great, great, great. Wonderful. Thank you. So it's my job to say a few words about Nita before she starts talking. So um, Nita, Nita was born um, a Korach, that was her maiden name, and she is my dad's first cousin. So she's Kathy's and my first cousin once removed. <laughs> and our families have been very close all of our lives. Um, and so it's always a pleasure to be out here with Nita today. Um, Nita married Vince Gizdic uh, right out of high school when she graduated from Watsonville High School. And On Friday, yes, got married Sunday. Got, yep, yeah, <laughs> right after high school. No regrets. And she and Vince built this business together um, all of their lives. It was actually had been belonged to Vince's father before that, and then they continued on. They're, they were the second generation. And that Vince and Nita raised two sons, Vince and Mitchell. And today, the business is being managed by Nita's oldest son, Vince, and his wife, Cynthia. And I can assure you, though, that Nita is still out here, as you saw, every day greeting every car that comes into this driveway. So she, <laughs> she's, she's very, very much still a part of this business. But I want to say something more about Nita. Besides running this business and getting it up and off the ground and becoming the very, very well-known business that it is today. She's also been extremely involved in the local community. Um, she was the president of the Farm Bureau. She was the state delegate to the California Farm Bureau Federation. And she was, in 2004, the Ag Woman of the Year. So it, when you wonder sometimes why you see her picture in the newspaper just about every week, 
It's because of all of that. Nita Gistich. I have to hold that. I might not be able to speak uh, with this all the time. But anyway, thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to go back a little ways again. Uh, my father-in-law bought this ranch in 1934. He was living up in Oakland with his wife, and they had three little boys. And she, was, mother-in-law, was pregnant at the time, and they were, had a beautiful bakery shop. It was called the Gizditch Bakery Shop in Oakland. And they were doing wonderful. Eight years, beautiful. And all of a sudden, one morning, he got up and, <coughs> she's, what's the matter? And he says, I'm choking. Go to the doctor. So went to the doctor. The doctor says, what are you doing in life? And he said, well, I'm a baker. Well, the dust from the flour was collecting in his lungs. You better get out of there or you're not going to make it. And he said, okay, came home, told his wife, hey, we got to get out of here. They put the place up for sale and they came here. My father-in-law came with the middle son, Bud Gisditch, and they drove around Watsonville. And wouldn't you know, they come across this, 10 acres for sale. They couldn't believe it when they saw it. So they pulled up in the yard and said to the gentleman, well, wh wh what is this all about? Well, you'd get uh, five acres of open land, five acres of apples, house. And so he said, fine. Well, how much? Well, come on in the kitchen. Let's sit down and talk about it. He didn't say, let's go to the real estate office. You come in the house. So he came in the house. They sat down. They talked about it. What, uh, 3400 Hey, I'll take it. That's what it went for. So it was beautiful. Well, when can we come and get this ranch? They said, hey, December is a good time. We'll be finished with the crop here, and it'll be yours. So by golly, they sold the bakery shop in Oakland, and here they came in December, around the 6th of December. And it had rained, of course, you know, poured. And coming up the driveway, like you did in the bus, there was no asphalt. It was all dirt. And wouldn't you know it? The moving van got stuck coming up with all their furniture, but they met their neighbors across the street. They had three little boys, and their last name was Biscup. Maybe some of you knew the Biscups. Yes, of course. And they went over there, and Mr. Biscup came because he had a tractor and pulled that big old moving van right up into the yard here, and they got out, and my mother-in-law, they were in the car right behind it. She says to my father-in-law, the children have to go to the bathroom. You know what my uh, father-in-law said? You know what that meant in those days? Outhouse. She goes, oh, my gosh. She took the children out there to the outhouse, came back. He says, she said, well, turn the lights on in the house. The kids are cold. We were going in the house. He looked at the gentleman that drove the motor home and said, uh, do you have a match? <laughs> Coral oil, ca lanterns, kerosene stove. My mother-in-law said if she knew how to drive a car, she would have back to Oakland. <laughs> but, you know, in 1st of January, they had a little girl, and they raised four kids here. It was wonderful in those days. And so the apples were doing beautifully here. And they raised the apples. And I don't know why, but all those Croatians that came here in those days, they knew what to do with that ground. A lot of them planted brand new orchards. Some went to work for you. Some, you know, helped you raise your apples. And that's how it all started here in the valley. Of course, there was a lot of Irish here already, a lot of Italians and <clears throat> Portuguese or whoever. There was a lot of different kinds, but they were really strong in farming. And that's how it all started. And so in those days, you had a beautiful apple tree, just like that. This part here, that was open ground at that time. My husband and <clears throat> his father, they planted this five acres here about 45 years ago. So that tree, these there, the big ones are 45. But, you know, sometimes they don't last that long, just like this one here, got a broken limb. And when it gets a broken limb and the water gets down in it, it'll rot the whole tree very shortly after. And that's what's going to happen. They'll have to tear that tree out. And when we tear the tree out, we put a semi-dwarf. Can you see how many more trees I could get in there with the semi-dwarf instead of standard big tree? Cheaper, because you don't have to have a big ladder. You don't have to prune way up high. It's cheaper to have, what, three semi-dwarfs instead of one big standard. But in those days, nobody knew what a semi-dwarf apple tree was. There wasn't such a thing. It was all standard, and that's what it looked like. And would you believe 
You had to pick your apples in an old bag, and that's how you picked it. You even got a job, put the bag on, and you walked up that ladder. It was all wood. It better be good and strong. My husband built this when he was eight. I know he was what he told me. He was 12 years old when he was building ladders for the ranch. So you had your bag here, and you picked your apples, and you put them in the bag, and you walked over. Well, I guess I went too fast. Oh, my gosh. I got to go back a little bit. You didn't have a bag. You picked apples like this and with your box, and you walked up that ladder with your box, and it better be in there in a good, good position because when that box got full of apples, it could knock the whole ladder over, huh? But that's how they picked them, in an apple box. And you put it right there, and you stack them up, and at the end of the evening, you'd come with a trailer and a little buggy and pick up those boxes and take them over there. And maybe you had somebody that would ship them for you. Or maybe you had somebody that was going to buy them from you. And that worked out for many, many years, that you had somebody that would buy your apples from you. You didn't have to worry about what the apple really was like. Just pick them off the tree. And it was a wonderful time then. And then after, pretty soon, they said, that's too dangerous getting up and down that ladder. And that's when they went to that bag. Oh, put it on backwards, <laughs> dummy. And you picked your apples in that bag. And you filled the bag up. Can you imagine filling that bag up, up and down that ladder, walking over to the bin? And you just took the hook off, and down went the apples. Hey, you hired all kinds of people those days. They came from uh, Oklahoma. They came from all over to pick. And they would live in the orchard. It was amazing how many of them I met. They would come here, those people. We had a name for them, and I won't mention it. But they lived out in the orchard. And it was wonderful. They were such nice people. All they cared was as long as we had some water for them. That's all they cared about. And they would pick the apples. And it was wonderful how they learned how to pick those apples in those bins. And... It worked out perfect. And today, we pick our apples and we put them in. And you could see all the bands over there that will be used. And we have coal storages in Watsonville. <clears throat> Not too many coal storages left in Watsonville. But we still have good old Marinovich's coal storages that we use all the time. And so we take our bins down there and put them in the coal storage. We have our own washing outfit here in town. So it works out perfect. But I can remember that last year when apples were just gorgeous here in Watsonville. Oh, my gosh, you wanted to eat a Red Delicious right off the tree. That's when they tasted the best. And pippins were great, great. People needed pippins all over the country, and they were being shipped all over. And all of a sudden, if I remember the date, maybe about 40 years ago, just about 40 years ago, they said, oh, God. The pippins are ready to, uh, or the red delicious are ready to pick. Let's pick and let's get them shipped to uh, San Francisco. No, 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 they're going to L.A. Okay, fine, we'll ship them to L.A. And we are always three to four weeks before Washington up north. And so we picked our apples and we packed them nicely. God, they look gorgeous. And we shipped them and the next day we called down there and said, hey, what would we get for our apples? Nothing much. Wait a minute. We're the first ones, all of California, to have apples. Well, what had happened in those days? Watsonville was a little slow. We didn't have those cold storages that were called controlled atmosphere. We didn't have them yet here in Watsonville. But Washington had them. And if you had them, you put your apples in there, they could stay a year, over a year. And what happened, we send our apples down there to L.A. Washington opened up their co controlled atmosphere and flooded the market. Just give me whatever you can for those apples, he said, Washington said. Flooded the market. We said, up, oh, that was it. And that's when we changed our whole business here of being our own deliverers. Pie shop started a little bit. Or you come and pick your own apples. 
I can remember in front of the antique shop over there, we're polishing apples with a rag. My father-in-law came one day and said, what are you doing? Well, we're going to sell. We put a little sign out here on the highway. We're going to sell a box of apples. Can you imagine right there? The small ones were two fifty, two dollars and fifty cents. That is, then three, and then three fifty, and so that's what we were doing. Shine it, my father says. No way, you never. You want people to come in this yard? Yes, we do. Anyway, we sold out that first day. Everything they picked. So my husband said, "That's right. We'll pick early tomorrow morning, and you could start cleaning again." My father came and says, "Where's the apples? We sold them all." He says, where's a rag? <laughs> he got a rag, and boy, I tell you, he was cleaning those apples as fast as he could. He would have never believed it if he didn't see it himself, that those apples sold so fast, so fast. But that's how we started to get rid of our apples. And then pretty soon, as the years went on along, you know, it was nice to have those cold storages downtown for everybody. And they did get into control atmosphere, and we use them today, which was wonderful. But all of a sudden, apples just weren't doing too good in Watsonville anymore. And so, you know, you'd have somebody come up to you, and you might have had 50 acres of apples. They'd walk up and say, hey, you want to pull those apples out? I'll lease that ground from you. Hey, gee, how much? Blah, blah, blah. I don't know how much they got for it. He said, okay, we'll pull them out. That's just like next door. It was our neighbors right there next door. Matlitch's, I think it was. Matlitch's. Was it Itch? <laughs> Beautiful orchard there all our lives, you know. And somebody came and said, pull them out and we'll lease. And by golly, that's what happened to that whole orchard. And it's been leased every year. All kinds of different people have leased it. And it's open ground right now, ready to be planted in another month. But that's how apples started leaving the area. There was really not a market for our apples anymore. So we got into the berries. So what do we call these big sticks that are in the tree? Anybody know what we call those sticks? What do we call it? Props. props. Exactly, those are props. Because when those apples start growing, getting heavy, you better prop up that limb. Because if it breaks, it never grows back again. So it'll be prop time, not, not yet. We like the apples to get a little bigger than a golf ball, and then we'll start propping. And I hope we can get some apples that'll look like that this year. And so we still make our apple juice every year, which is great. And our base of our apple juice is always the pippin. And that's what you want for your base. And that's why we keep our pippins. We have a lot of acres. We farm a little over 100 and some acres. And over half of the apples are pippins because we need that for our pies and for our juice. It makes the best base. And everybody says, yeah, but what else do you put in there? Well, whatever apple we're harvesting. We can have nine different varieties of apples in our juice. And people say, but your juice always tastes the same. So nice. I say, it just does. We know the recipe. We know the recipe. And they love it. They love it. Pippins were always, of course, number one, red delicious. And there was some... Um, uh, Granny Smith's, uh, not Granny Smith's, uh, God, I can't even think of all the names. There were too many names. Uh, like, no, nah, can't think of all those names. But it was always towards the end of August and first of September was apple season time. And that's when, you know, you had to work. And we had to go back to school. What a shame. <laughs> <laughs> we loved it because we had to go back to school. <laughs> But you know what to do after school, don't you? You came home, change your clothes, make yourself a jelly sandwich, and come down to the field. I know it. It was either water the tomatoes or the zucchinis or pick the windfalls. It was always a job. But no regrets. We all grew up to be good people. We enjoyed our working that we had to do in those days. And it's still fun.
important part about the Croatian culture is that you say that you go to work and take a jug of wine with them and everybody took their turns of, of bringing the jug and they probably add a little bit of water to it and then while they're doing their hard labor work or so, um, they had a little bit of wine. And that was part of the customary of uh, the uh, Croatian uh, Im immigrants, I think, at the very beginning. So Now, the, the gentleman that makes the last one, the Grossin, the Red, Leo's mission is to help forge the next generation of his country's winemakers. Many students that have graduated from the University of Zoology, like I said, come to work with him at a program called Vino Lab. And I just uh, hope you, all of you have a great time and welcome uh, to our place here. Thank you so much for coming. Jivieli. That's it. Okay.